Coming up on this episode of Greyhound Nation, veterinarian and researcher Dr. Rob Gillette sits down to talk with John about Greyhound Sports Medicine. Stay tuned. The Nation is next. This is Greyhound Nation, episode 30, recorded August 2nd, 2022. Dr. Rob Gillette on Greyhound Sports Medicine. Greyhound Nation is a podcast for Greyhound enthusiasts produced by Greyhound enthusiasts. To learn more about our show and its hosts, visit our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. Welcome to another episode of the Greyhound Nation podcast. I'm Michael Burns. Now, here's your host, John Parker. Welcome back, Greyhound lovers, to the best Greyhound podcast in the world. Our guest uh, for this episode is Dr. Rob Gillette, who I've known quite a few years. Uh, He's had a lot of involvement with Greyhounds in sports medicine, and uh, he's got a lot of information and uh, background to, to, to share with us. So, Rob, welcome. Well, thanks so much for having me, John. This is this is this is a lot of fun getting to work with you again. Uh, let's go back. I always, with our guests, want a little bio, and I, I know our listeners are always always interested in in somebody's uh, educational ba- background, their greyhound yep. background, et cetera. Tell us a little bit about uh, your where you're from originally, and uh, also where you got your veterinary degree and so forth. Sure. Uh, I was born and raised in Western Kansas in a town called Great Bend, Kansas which is right next to or right up by Cheyenne Bottoms. And if anybody knows uh, racing history, they know that the first uh, coursing meet was held at Cheyenne Bottoms. Uh, and it was related to the National Greyhound Coursing Association. So I, I have that little claim to fame there. Um, uh, although I didn't know it at the time where I was growing up. I grew up um, uh, hunting with uh, a bird dog named Ben and a retriever named Adrian. And... Um, uh, I would say that I didn't really understand the athleticism of the dogs I worked with. <clears throat> then I went to uh, veterinary school at Kansas State University. I graduated in 88, but uh, while I was there, um, one summer I was working for a, a practice out in Littleton, Colorado, and went up to the dog track and uh, met uh, the track veterinary there, Dr. Earl Carlson, and he took me to the backside and um, once uh, that greyhound put his, his head on my leg, I said, man, I, I would love to work with these guys. Um, and so I started a little a path or course towards uh, learning more about greyhounds. I've, I've always been a more of a fringe player in the greyhound world. I, there's certainly major people that know so much uh, and so devoted to the, the sport, the industry, the breed. Um, I kind of poke my head in sometimes, learn some stuff. Uh, provide some information, then kind of get back out for a while. But it's not that I don't love them because I I really do. And when I got out of veterinary school, I was living in the Kansas City area and taking care of uh, some of the dogs up the dog track and uh, and some of the the breeders in the Kansas City area and and the Abilene area. and thought, well, maybe uh, uh, I should understand what my clientele is going through. So I bought a, I partnered up on a female named Kiowa Germany, and uh, that was my first uh, portal into the greyhound world. Um, she was a great dog. We, we had a few pups out of her. I got to be a very good uh, adoption dog raiser and not necessarily the greatest uh, raiser of the, the elite <laughs> level greyhound athletes, but I, I loved it every bit, of the t- every bit of the time I was there. I uh, then went to the University of Kansas uh, while I was working there and got a postdoc in human uh, performance, sports medicine, and um, exercise physiology and applied all that stuff from the human side and, and, and put it into the Greyhound. Our goal at the time, I actually received the uh, first uh, research grant given out by the Kansas Racing Commission to look at understanding how Greyhounds run and, and the potential for reducing racing injuries at the time. That was, that was the start of it all, John. And at some point, I think it was 97, I moved down to uh, um, Auburn University, was on uh, faculty there for 15 years, and that's where I met you and, and got introduced to, to more worlds of stuff. It was, it was a great, great time down there. 
Now so that's the, that's uh, that's my introduction. There you go. That's pretty darn good. Uh, was it was it during that in the nineties then that you were uh, when you were talking when you were working with the Racing Commission? Did you do some work on research on um, track surfaces and how they uh, related to injuries or absence of injuries? Yeah, that's that's what's really kind of cool about my uh, experiences in the Greyhound world is, is as I've learned through the Greyhound, it's expanded out to many different areas, whether it's um, sled dogs or foxhounds or uh, the military dogs. There's a little bits of things that I learned uh, early when I was working with the Greyhounds that have ended up being uh, benefits in other areas of the, the dog world from a performance standpoint. I uh, was lucky enough to interact with um, Keith Dillon and, um, and, a, and a group of uh, uh, the Phelan brothers. They were they introduced me to Greyhounds and um, and to the elite athleticism of the dogs and that's really kind of a flip for a veterinarian a veterinarian a lot of times we'll see a, a dog uh, after there's an injury or a sickness or an illness and so to learn the what I call the left side of the event um, the the area where you're trying to find ways to optimize the the ability of the dog um, um, results in actually a reduction in injuries, re results in a reduction of the sicknesses and the illnesses. And so my focus initially started on the racing surface and um, track design, bankings of the turns. Uh, we did a lot of work back in the, in the days, still do a lot. I did some consulting around the country with different racetracks back in the 90s and 2000s and 2010s. I've, I've somehow always kind of kept uh, and my foot in the door there but yeah racing services and it's it's so interesting to me john is because when i look at um, other breeds other dogs from a veterinary standpoint and i'm thinking of lameness or rehabilitation related to injuries uh i always ask the owner like what's your surface at home you know uh is it a hardwood floor is it a carpeted floor what kind of backyard do you have because Everything I learned from the Greyhound tells me that that paw to surface impact has a huge effect on, on the musculoskeletal system of the dog. So, yeah, the racing surface, the, the paw to surface interaction, those were some of the earliest um, research I did, yeah. Well, delve back. I know this was a long time ago, but delve back into your memory bank for us and give us some little gems that you learned about racing service at the track in terms of depth and composition and so forth. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny you mention that, John, because uh, if we think about a racing surface, you know, we're trying to design a surface like you would a shoe for a human. And you want the surface to provide absorption from the impact. At the same time, you want the surface to provide traction. Um, for those of us that our dogs run in fields, is, I guess what I'm getting at is uh, we certainly, from a racing industry standpoint, wanted to have the safest surface. And that's key. That's important. Um, because that's showing how much um, effort the industry put into the safety of the dogs. If you look at the percentages of injuries in the racing greyhound compared to many other sp sports, uh, they're minuscule. I mean, I think if I remember right, they were 0.8% or maybe 1%. When you look at uh, youth sports, they're around 30%. <laughs> So, um, you know, and I, you bring up comments, I bring up comments like that, and it's not to compare or say one's right or wrong. It's just that there was a lot of effort put in there. Now, that said, um, when I have my dogs run around in the backyard or in the fields or we go out, you know, someplace uh, where, where they run, I can't say that that surface was designed for them. But understanding that foot-to-surface contact has allowed me to better understand the stresses and the forces upon uh, the paw or the musculoskeletal system of not only the greyhound, but retrievers, bird dogs, um, herding dogs, uh, military dogs. That impact, those, those impacts actually have an effect on the dog. And if you prepare that, prepare, if you train to prepare the structure for those types of stressors or forces, all dogs benefit from that. Not just the greyhounds, but the pets. Any any dog benefits from that, and I I learned that from from understanding how the greyhound works. <laughs> what about banking? What did you find was the optimum uh, degree of banking on the track in the turns? 
Well, that's kind of funny, John, because if you know, if you go with a NASCAR type banking, or you got like a you know almost like a forty five degree, yeah, uh, that's the forces that the dog really needs as it's going around to turn. But the banking is dependent, and I know you you're going to love this part because this gets into physics. Has <laughs> <laughs> it their centrifugal force, centripetal forces, and so the banking of the turn is somewhat different depending on the diameter or the, the radius of the turn. I mean, Lincoln track up in Rhode Island had a very tight turn. Um, you go to the tracks in uh, Texas, they, they, they developed a very big diameter turn. Um, they actually had a very high bank in Texas. Uh, sometimes when you started to manage the banks at these different levels, um, you ran into uh, OSHA rules, like a tractor working the track uh, can't be on a certain angle of track. So, you know, cause it increased the insurance costs related to that. So, and then the other thing that kind of came along is as we went to the, as they designed the bigger tracks and the, and the higher banking, the bigger dogs could hold it when they couldn't have held it before. And so in some of those areas, you saw a shift in the types of dogs that would run at the different tracks. You always had a variation throughout the United States of dogs designed for different tracks. Um, but you saw there in the, the late 80s, 90s, uh, where some of the bigger dogs started to, to run different. And I, again, I defer to the, 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 the guys that, that ran and, and managed dogs at the tracks. You know, again, I say I was, I was a fringe, kind of a fringe player. Those guys really knew that, that stuff better than I did. You know, it's a question I've always had, Rob, is when they built, when they actually built the track, you were talking about the difference in the tightness of the turns or, or maybe... <clears throat> I remember at Derby Lane, the, the, the home stretch was a little bit longer. Who, who did these track management folks uh, confer with, consult with, in, desi- in deciding, okay, we're going to have a, a tighter turn or we're going to have a longer home stretch or, or whatever it might be? Did they, was, it, was it just based on how much land they had to deal with and, and to fit the track within the confines of the venue, or, or were they actually consulting with, with veterinarians or people that were, were like, you know, your, your uh, expertise? Well, in the early days, it, they would fit a track in somewhere, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. The big thing is, you know, when it comes to track design, um, you know, I was talking with uh, uh, Dr. Payne over in, in um, England the other day. You know, in a lot of cases, the bank's not necessarily important if the turn's wide enough because uh, you can see a shift in how the, the dog goes around the turn. Um, but I, to your point, I think early they fit tracks into environments. You know, the, the, the Americans wanted a longer stretch to kind of mimic the horse racing. Whereas you look at England and Australia and the other, other countries, the, the, the home stretch or the straightaways aren't quite as long. And so it's really a different, it's a different race than it is over here. Um, but the Americans kind of liked this long straightaway that they got with the Greyhounds. And again, I would... I would defer, you know, to the to the race people uh, for that. Uh, but initially, they were putting tracks into places, and then when I kind of came along in the late '80s, '90s, uh, so much science went into the design of the track. But it was still, you know, a construction company coming in and architects and who were who had to work with the design of the of the surface. I later started working quite a bit with. Um, Dr. Mick Peterson, I think he's at the university. He is at the University of Kentucky now, and he's done quite a bit of great work with the racing surfaces and the horse. But we met, I think it was in 2000 at the Racetrack Industry Program conference in um, Arizona, and he'd been. It was just funny because we'd been doing parallel work at the same time. I was trying to develop a an instrument that could be placed on the track to measure impacts. And he was doing a similar thing, only he was a real engineer, <laughs> and so he knew how to build the equipment. I just had this theory in a box, and uh, you know, and he laughed at me. He said, "You know, if I was to put that on the track, Rob, that would flip out of the, out of the stadium." And I said, "Okay, I get it. I get it." So it, it was fun working with him. He, they've really taken that uh, a long ways, and in the in the, the United States, you know, and, and I shouldn't say that across the world, the Australians, the the Brits, the Irish. Uh, they've put a lot of effort into racing safety, mostly because, you know, it's, it's all about the sport and it's about the safety of the dog. It's, 
And you want to have equal racing, you know, cross the dogs so that, uh, you know, each one has a fair chance to, to win. I mean, it's, it's all about f fairness and safety, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's move on to when your, your time at, at Auburn, that's where you and I first met. Uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about how you came to be at Auburn and what position that you, uh, you took. Yeah. So <clears throat> back in 97, um, uh, me and Diana and, and Brad and a dog named Germs, that same uh, brood female that I, I'd started out with, we hopped in a U-Haul and we went down to Auburn University. I had taken a position as a, um, with the Scott Ritchie Research Institute. And um, and I worked uh, under Dr. Steve Swaim where we um, did a lot of wound healing and reconstructive surgery. Uh, but I still had greyhounds. Um, you know, at that time I started running them uh, in Birmingham, uh, in Montgomery. Um, we had some running in the Florida tracks. I wanted to keep them kind of close so that we could go see them. Um, although it's funny because when I go see them, I really couldn't watch them run. I had to step out. <laughs> Diana would stay in there and she'd come out and tell me because I was just. And it was a lot of emotion when you watch your dog run. And, oh, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, so we moved down there and. I got introduced to, uh, to to a whole new world that I had not really seen in in Kansas. You know, I, I knew the bird hunting world, the bird dogs. I knew uh, <clears throat> the greyhounds. Uh, knew some about retrievers, but I got down there, got introduced to the foxhounds and the and the the coonhounds and the lurchers and a, a whole another world of um, you know, and the and the and the plantation dogs. That was really so cool to go in there and watch. You know these dogs work and um got introduced to that and through uh a th was that the nga that i think you and i met not nga the ag S southeast the G G gpa i believe we had you up yes. to speak at the gpa convention in atlanta that's right i you know i um yeah that's right and i think i had to leave in the middle of the lecture because there was a dog crashing in auburn i had to drive back and i so i apologize john i <laughs> <laughs> We forgave you. <laughs> yeah, up to that point, I had worked with Elaine Schultz out of the Southwest Missouri Adoption, and I had we had raised a few litters, and and she was kind enough and she was great to find homes for them. But I, at some point, Diana and I went down there to uh, a meet the owner picnic, and I, I'm sorry I'm digressing back to the Kansas days, but. Um, Went down there, and all my puppies, who were now you know two or three years, all ran up to me, and it was I tell you, it was it was such a emotional tough time. I said, Diane, I, I can't, and she was the same way. We can't do this anymore. So we uh, we quit raising then, raising dogs, and, and we moved to where we would uh, look for you know one year old or eighteen month old dogs and go that route. And yeah. then so yeah. I got down, and that's how I met you, is because I was associated with the American Greyhound. Uh, adoption group and and all that and that's how yeah. I came to interact with you. Yeah. Now you you ultimately at Auburn uh, started the sports medicine department. Tell us about that. <clears throat> yeah, that was so as a continuation of my earlier work, I developed a working athletic dog lab there, and it was it was great because if as one of my um, greyhounds would retire from the track, we we'd bring him into the to the veterinary school there, and I had uh, they were maintained very well. Um, we had a uh, we had of course we had some fields in the back area where I could they got to run either twice a week or once a week depending on the time in between we wanted to rest them, and it was just like I don't want to I don't know how to describe heaven for a dog, but for these guys you know uh, they were doing everything they wanted to do. I mean it's it's hard for a lot of people to understand how driven and how much these greyhounds love to run and how much they love to chase something. It's, and that was what was kind of cool about that, John, is that, you know, we had the veterinary students there who had never seen anything like this before. And we'd take them out and, you know, they would hold on to one of these greyhounds who were running to let go, you know, who's running to run. And they had to understand how to hold them. And, it, and well, that's the one comment that I would get from them as they would get through with their, week or two weeks they were with us i didn't i just didn't understand the energy in these these dogs and um 
so we had we had that and then um, we also had uh, I had uh, six bird dogs so I had sprint animals and I had endurance dogs there <clears throat> and, the, and the students would get to play with them well they were learning I don't mean play with them but they, it was a nice it was a nice opportunity the freshmen would come out and work with them and they'd get to touch dogs then the seniors would come out and learn more from a medical standpoint and um, it, and it's what's kind of neat about that so much came out of that we um, we put heart rate monitors on them and I don't know if you remember this or not but uh, we would my I, I, would, I would take a, a temperature a pulse and respiration then we'd go down we'd set up I'd show them the lure as you know, so they'd know where the lure was and then we'd hand slip them and they would run you know anywhere from 75 to 200 yards and then we would pull them over and we'd take a temperature pulse and respiration and what was kind of interesting was that you know after they ran, we always saw this increase in heart rate and temperature, which was really hadn't been documented too much. I think Phil Toll and Pichel had written a paper a little bit about where they had done some stuff on a track, but this was really kind of unheard of at the time. I've always been a little ahead of the curve. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we, we did that. And then I, I had this heart rate monitor, and we put this heart rate monitor on when they run. And it was so... It just kind of blew me away. We, we walked the Greyhound down there. We ran the Greyhound. And then we looked at the data later. And the heart rate were, was actually faster and higher when the Greyhound saw the lure than from the run itself. That was, that was a shift. That was a shift really in thinking about the excitement of the performance dog. I mean, they always, you know, we always kind of like, we'll take the dog out there. And, it's, and, and there's so many dogs that are affected by this this excitement, whether it's a greyhound or a retriever or, but we really saw it in the greyhound. The greyhound, you know, they certainly have this, I guess you call it prey drive, whatever it is, but it's an excitement. We actually got a very nice paper out of that, published um, research article out of that data. Yeah, uh, I, but I we can learned... remember you're telling me about that. And I think I actually read the paper and I, it, it changed the way that when I, in, in, when I was running my greyhounds in lure coursing and still to this day, I try to keep them out of sight of the lure before they run so that the heart rate is not so high and they're not heating yeah. up and so forth, even on a, on a nice winter day. Uh, and so it's been my practice and I've encouraged other people to do this, to, to, you know, get behind a vehicle or, or the, the, the equipment trailer. But not or under the vehicle, there. buy a muffler. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I, there's people <laughs> that would put them under a vehicle, but it's a little too close to the muffler. <laughs> yes, you don't exactly. want to do that. <laughs> but um, that, I just found that really fascinating. Uh, do you think yeah. that enhances that that increased heart rate before they run when they see the lure enhances performance or or decreases it? Well, and that's funny because uh, John and you know you guys know greyhounds very well or, or sighthounds. Let's, let's we could even take it out to sighthounds because they all have that that drive or that excitement. Um, there's a diversity. Some of them are crazy some of them are not you know i i had a little dog um oh, what was her name when they would put her in the in the in the in the starting box she'd start bouncing around she was so excited that about half the time um casey will win half the time the the the, the box would open and she back she'd be backwards and they could never get her, even when they would try to put an extra wall in her to make the, the box smaller, they could never get her from bouncing around in, in, and, uh, in, in the crates or in the starting box. So you have this, and I saw that. You know, we had a little, uh, when we were doing that study, we had a little dog named Hannah. And um, Hannah was just, it's hard to hold her. Now, it's lucky she was only like a 50 pound greyhound. Then we had another one that was like an 80 pound greyhound that was just nuts. Then we had a couple of them that they would just kind of walk out there, and then when you get ready to hand slip them, it would turn on, and then it'd turn off. You know, I just, so you do have a diversity, but you have to. I think the key to it, John, is to understand it could be there, and some of these dogs have that. And if I'm worried about overheating, if I'm worried about performance, uh, all that, I need to find a way to, to manage that, and, and adapt my management of that dog for that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I've had a. I've had a couple of greyhounds over the years that are just cool as cucumbers Sorry. in the um, uh, waiting to run. They just walk to the to slips like it was just another day at the office. No barking, yeah. no carrying on. And boy, when that lure moved, 
the game was on and uh, they wasted no energy in the paddock. You know, they just went, they, oh, yeah. they walked in a stately manner to the slips and off they went. And th- those, those are my favorite kind to have because they required much less management. You know, you didn't yeah. have to worry about them overheating or, or barking too much and leaving all their energy in the paddock. Uh, yeah. But they're, they're, they're pretty far, few and far between. I've found most, most of the greyhounds I've had, you know, they're, they get very excited once they see that, that lure or even seeing the other dogs run on a course. So, well, and um, that's that's that, a good point. That's valuable because, research for sure. Okay. Well, that's I, that's kind of interesting, John. Um, I wanted to make a quick comment on that because sure, this excitement that we see in the greyhounds, um, you know, it's something that um, they just truly actually they'll actually change their physiology. The, the the metabolism changes related to that excitement, and that's what we picked up in the data we were collecting. But it's funny because that led to some other things. Like when we were uh, developing the military dogs for the Iraq War, Afghanistan War, those dogs had that same excitement to do things. But we knew how to address it, how to how to manage it, how to look after it or look for it because of what we'd learned from the greyhounds. Yeah, it, it truly is amazing the amount of uh, knowledge, information, uh, has come out of research on greyhounds that, that was then used to benefit other dogs. Yeah, and, so. I, and I hate to say research on greyhounds because that, that, got, that has a really negative connotation to it. But because everything we were doing was letting the dogs do whatever they wanted, and then we would just, you know, we just acquired data while they were doing it. So yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was a very positive program I had there at Auburn. I, I can remember uh, when you were at Auburn, when we'd bring a dog down for you to, we had a, you know, kind of mystery lameness or a bad toe or whatever. And we're going to get into yep. toes in a second. I'd come down with the dog. And one of the benefits of, of the drive at making that drive was you'd always take me out to wherever the, the research was going on with the yeah. greyhounds. And there was always something different. It was really cool. <laughs> I, I tell us about some other research yeah. you tests you did greyhounds with greyhounds involving running. Yeah. Well, and, and that's, that's kind of cool. So, one of the things I wanted to understand, because I, I had figured out uh, the biomechanics of what optimized speed, if you will, in a greyhound, um, we realized that the um, conditioning, the back muscles, was important um, related to a uh, the sprint speed. We realized that um, over the length of a race or a course, whatever it is, that there's actually a... a, a fatigue of the digital muscles um, whereas uh, you know the foot does this right and if you if you feel your just distal to your elbow you got muscles in there well these greyhounds and dogs are impacting that all the time and just the distance of a quarter mile to uh, um, a little farther than that or whatever mile or distance they're, they're running whether they're out in the field um, those muscles will fatigue itself and when the dog first takes off, they're very taut um, because they're they're tight, and it, they, they go through this what we call eccentric contraction, where the muscles are trying to contract at the same time they're elongating, and that will put some fatigue on it. And as they, and it, but you, it creates a spring effect, and the spring effect actually is positive because it kind of pops the leg up and goes through the same thing in the vertebral muscles through the glutes down through the, the, the leg and through the stifle to the hocks, you get the same spring effect. It's a coil effect, and as they stretch it, it pops up. But as they fatigue, you start to lose that. And as they it, once they start to kind of get into that fatigue state, they're actually having to work harder because they've lost that, uh, that spring effect. Um, and that's also kind of the time where, hmm, we could be more predisposed to injury, um, although it's the greyhounds are so well designed, really, to minimize injury. I mean, if you think about all the dogs that run around uh, at an event, and there's, it's, it's a rarity when, when someone actually gets injured. You know, when you look at the number of dogs. And that's one thing that I learned that I could take back into a pet population is that if you conditioned and trained and worked the dog, the structure was actually stronger, and we reduced the amount of lameness and injuries in a pet population. 
we got so many dogs out there that are really kind of couch potatoes and not doing anything because we're scared they'll get hurt. Well, you have to introduce, there's actually uh, Wolf's Law and Davis's Law. There are a couple of uh, exercise physiological theorems that uh, the bones will um, form their shape according to the forces placed upon them. And Davis's Law is a corollary where the muscles and the soft tissues are the same. And so if you don't do anything, you actually get this atrophy of loss of structure. And so you really need exercise to build the structure and strengthen it up. And that's what's kind of cool about a greyhound because it's always kind of there in, in, in that breed. Yeah. So that's, a, that's yeah. another thing we learned related to the running. One thing I've always debated with, and, and it's, it's a debate carried on in the sighthound community at large for, for amateur sports like lure coursing and, and racing, uh, is warm up the best the best method of warm up? Some people uh, take the dogs out and let them trot alongside them. Uh, some do stretching exercises. In your experience, what's what's the optimum warm up technique before they run a lure course? Yeah, or we've an oval. That's funny because I I graduated from high school in 1977. When you're like. How'd Rob go down this path? <laughs> but <laughs> but I was uh, when I was uh, a freshman at Kansas State, my undergrad, my my PE um, uh, paper, I had to do a research paper, was on why should you warm up or not. And that's always stuck with me ever since then. You know, you want to warm up the muscles that are going to be used. You know, when you go out and, you know, try to touch your toes and stretch your hamstrings and all these stuff, and you do these kind of fast jerk types of um uh, stretches, they realize that's not necessarily beneficial for the muscles that are as you go into the performance. And so a light movement, uh, the, the jogging, the trotting, the, any of the stretching they're doing, they're not really doing any of these high strain stretches uh, with, the, with the greyhounds. But what's kind of funny about that, John, if I wanted to actually debate myself, which happens a lot with the voices in my head, <laughs> is that when you look at the Thompson's Gazelle, and who's getting chased by the cheetah, they don't do stretches before they take off. They just take off and go, you know? So there are many of those where you can kind of get in a discussion, well, do they need to be warmed up? Um, I, I think they do, you know, at the track, you know, they were trotted up and down, uh, paraded. And that really helped kind of stimulate some of the blood supply, the blood flow and all that, warmed the... And there's these inter interfascial uh, planes that uh, need to be kind of warmed up so that the hyaluronic acid between them is moving smoothly. And, and that kind of type of activity, I think, is, is great for warming them up. Then when they get done, you really kind of need to walk them around and, and, and uh, w let them cool down or whatever you want to call them when they get done. It's almost as important as the warming up before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I see uh, in cold weather uh, climates when there's racing, uh, they seem to put the, 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 the rugs, as they call them, the blank, the mm -hmm. coats back on them fairly quickly. And I've always wondered maybe they should, if they should leave them off a little while, uh, because of that core temperature that the greyhounds built up, maybe whether they need to, to walk a little while and to cool down before they put the coat back on. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's, what's kind of cool as well, because, um, when we were doing the, the greyhounds, we actually realized that. Um, so when I was working with dog, again, my mom said, you know, Rob kind of marches to the beat of a different drummer. And I've always kind of been this way. Um, when I was working the dog tracks in Kansas city, if a dog came off hot and we knew they were hot, uh, and we, sometimes we'd have to use a dairy thermometer to get the temperature because it would go above what the thermometer would have. Um, we'd throw them in a tank of ice water and to cool them down real quick. And what it always worked. I never had a dog overheat. Now, never is not, that's a, not a very good scientific term. Of all the dogs I worked with, we rarely had a dog overheat coming off the track. And we, in the summer, we get pretty hot temperatures there. But that, there were some papers that came out in the veterinary world where they said you should not do that because uh, there's, a, there's a shift in how the blood supplies and, and you're keeping the blood actually in the core where it's doing some damage. And uh, it took me a while to figure out what was going on there. What I realized is it's a time factor, John. Um, when the dogs came off the track, we were cooling them. Sometimes we'd see temperatures up to 109 degrees. I mean, 
And that and later when I was working sled dogs, we realized those guys are reaching temperatures of 108, 109 commonly. I don't say commonly, but it's not rare while they're running. Theoretically, those are medical emergency levels of body temperature. <clears throat> but we'd get them off like that. It was a time thing. They were only exposed to that temperature within 30 seconds, maybe a minute or two. As opposed to a veterinarian who's in a practice where a dog overheats somewhere, gets put in a car and is driven somewhere, now they're a half hour, hour into it at that same high body temperature. And if you, if you relate that to sticking you know, some liver in the, in the oven, if I stick uh, a slice of liver in the oven at 150 degrees for 30 seconds, it won't, well, 10 seconds, it wouldn't really do anything to liver. But if I leave it in there for 30 minutes or an hour, it's it's a it's a te- it's not only a temperature it's it's a it's a duration of time that is exposed to that temperature. I think the real reason that um, when they put the coats on right after the race is you have such a a flow of heat coming off that body, and the temperature is so cold outside that you need to keep that heat in. And those coats aren't on for a long period of time, only to get the dog, you know, from the track to the kennel or to the truck, and then then they're taken off. So. I, I, I see your point there, but I, I don't think that's really a, a, a major factor. That's good. That's good. Uh, well, let's talk a second about, um, well, more than a few seconds, about greyhound toes, the bane of mm. every greyhound owner's existence, whether they're involved in, in sports or not. Uh, I, I've known as many people that have had greyhound sprain or dislocate a toe in the backyard running around as I have uh, running and lure coursing or, or racing. So, uh, what, let's talk about just kind of the physiology of sprains and dislocations. What, what happens when a greyhound does that to its toe? Well, and that goes back to the work with surfaces. You know, um, if you've got a long toenail, right, and you're running on grass or turf or sod type of surface, that nail can go into the surface. Now that nail is, is, is stuck in place there. But that nail is not like a cleat on a football shoe or a golf shoe or whatever. It's actually attached to the third phalanx uh, or the bones in the toe. And so when that, when that toe goes over, the foot turns. It just, it's just part of the natural movement. So now you're putting torsional forces on those digits, the toes. And those are the forces that create these problems. You know, I don't want to say we didn't see it on a racing surface at a track. Because in sand, the, the feet go in and the, the, the feet move a little bit. But when you get on sod or, or grass type surfaces, the nails and the pads get great grip. It's great traction. You want it. But on the other hands, it does, can predispose those distal extremities to problems. And my experience with toes, and it's not always the toe, John. You got to understand that the digital flexors and extensors are attached to those toes. So the toes really are an extension of this muscle and tendon. And I, from understanding that in greyhounds, has led me to have a, a vast understanding of lameness in dogs in the general population. Because actually it happens to a lot of pet dogs, but it's not enough to create s- clinical significance. You and your greyhound, The typical greyhound owners are so in tune with their dogs, they'll pick up if there's just a little thing going on with their toe. Um, Most pet owners don't quite pick it up. Yeah, my dog was a little gimpy for a few days last week, but now it's doing good. He gets back up on the couch. If all a greyhound had to do is get on a couch, (laughs) you know, then you probably wouldn't notice it either. So the way that they're, they are not necessarily more predisposed to it than other breeds, but we notice it because... It, we see it. One, you know, there's not much hair around there. So we see if a joint is swollen. We see if there's, a, you know, if they're kind of lightly holding it up. Um, so you've got three, three bones in each toe. And those bones are held together by what we call ligaments. Um, if anybody's played volleyball or basketball, they've, they've probably jammed a finger. It's very similar to what happens to dogs and or we could say greyhounds, if you will that these toes get injured a lot. And uh, I shouldn't say a lot. Of injuries, they can be, they can occur. And um, so 
if it's just a sprain, that's one thing. You can usually manage it uh, going forward. If it's actually a, a dislocation where the ligament is ruptured and we have a uh, displacement of the joint, it takes a long time for that to actually heal. And you, um, you actually have to do somewhat of a secondary healing. You can go in there either surgically and, and um, put sutures in around that uh, ligament to tighten that joint up. Uh, does that necessarily hold the joint? No, not really. But what happens is with those sutures in there, um, the, the scar tissue will be laid around it and actually cre create support for that joint. And so <clears throat> you can have also fractures of those. Now that's a, that's a different thing because on <clears throat> the, the deep, the superficial digital um, muscle attaches on the proximal end of P2, and then the deep digital attaches on P3. And the way that the foot hits, you can get fractures in the middle of P2, you can get fractures of P3, <coughs> and you can have dislocations of those joints based upon that. Um, it's really very easy to fix. If, if you say, okay, I've got a fat toe here, my dog seems to be lame, um, let me take that toe off, you change the whole biomechanics of how that foot hits the surface. And if we're talking a dog that is two years old, three years old, that paw grew up for two years to be designed to work one specific way. And now you've taken that toe off and you've changed the, the, the dynamics of that whole, faw, the whole paw. And not only the paw, but how it affects the rest of the, the proximal limb, the distal limb there. So... Toes are are, are are a huge importance uh, in a lot of breeds, but I think more so in the in the sight hounds because we see it. They're 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 really attuned to the dogs so that you pick it up. Yeah, so I guess amputation then is your absolute last resort, and you want to do everything you can short of that. You mentioned uh, suturing the the ligaments there. What what other modalities are there to address uh, dislocations? There. Um, so splinting is, I think, probably underutilized. We, you know, there is kind of it's kind of interesting, John. If if you go through this from a generation standpoint, 50s, 60s, 70s, even to the 80s, and part of the 90s, we had a large number of veterinarians who were exposed to racing greyhounds and their various maladies and injuries. <clears throat> and so you had a when I was coming up through the ranks, I remember in 89, I went down to a Greyhound veterinary conference in uh, in uh, West Palm, and all the greats were there, you know, Bloomberg and Taylor and, and D, and <clears throat> they had uh, Jim Gannon over from Australia, and I was just like wide-eyed walking around, oh my God, here's all these gods of the world that I've always wanted to be part of, and, and I learned so much from them, <clears throat> but <clears throat> it was really them also but it was also the the group getting together veterinarians from different parts of florida or oregon <clears throat> all co-mingling and interacting and discussing different things i learned many things almost uh you know at, at the bar later as i did from the lectures and not that i went to the bar but i mean in social <laughs> gatherings <clears throat> later we would talk about different things and 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 there is a, a salvage, we could call it a salvage procedure, where you can take sodium aureate or uh, ethanolamine oleate and inject it around the joint, uh, not in it, but around it. Uh, you, you splint it for five days, you <clears throat> crate rest it for five days, you walk it for five days, and then you go run it hard. Um, that was kind of an old veterinary treatment that was known amongst the Greyhound veterinarians. And utilized by them uh, that I think kind of went away when the the numbers of racing greyhounds uh, declined uh, that there's really not an exposure to that uh, <clears throat> um, that type of veterinary knowledge if you will you know totally for, for certainly it's a salvage procedure my option is to take a toe off you know what's my other option well I just I consulted with a veterinarian in I think Florida the other day said, hey, why don't you put a little suture around that ligament and that scar tissue will will uh, help hold that together and, and I think your the, the toe will be fine. And sure enough, it was. Um, it's a pretty easy uh, procedure to go in and, and put the suture in there. 
Um, yeah, this other one's somewhat controversial because it's not, you know, it was first published, I think, in an Australian journal back in 1968 and then brought up a couple more times around there um, where, where they would sclerose uh, toes. You know, it's very similar to, uh, what's the one I... There's one where they use 50% dextrose in the human world and um, and do very similar things. Um, but in my in my opinion, if I can save a toe and leave it on the dog, uh, I would do everything I can to do that as opposed to, to a lot of the amputations I see going on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, now, that, I understand there's no brought... there's no wrong there's no wrong veterinary decision because the veterinarian yeah. has to discuss with the owner What's best for them, <clears throat> and so it's it's a it's an open discussion. There's no, there's really from a veterinary side, there's really no right or wrong or how do you manage. You have options, and so you should you can provide the owner with certain options. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I brought several greyhounds to you when you were at Auburn for that very procedure, the sclerosing procedure, and I found that they held quite well and could return to performance probably about 60 to 70% of the time that they, yep. they weren't a hundred percent successful, but they were successful more than they were not. What was your, what was your, uh, over the years, what was your, uh, result? Figure? I guess it's 60%, you... John, if that's what you're saying. <laughs> that's just my dogs. <laughs> and I don't know that's if funny, it would have been, it might everybody have been else was 90%, John. <laughs> no, I don't. Because on, on, in racing, you know, you're, you're, as opposed to lure coursing or amateur racing on grass, you've got a more forgiving surface there for, for toes, don't yep. you? That's yeah. true. You know, but there's a, there's other things you can do nowadays. You know, after working with the sled dogs, I realized I could put sled dog booties on the paw and so that the in a rehabilitation setting so that the nail and the paw isn't getting grip on the surface. So I've minimized those torsional forces on the digits. That yeah. And it's little tricks like that that, I may not have known 25 years ago or 20 years ago that I do know now that uh, certainly the field of veterinary rehabilitation, you know, has certainly uh, moved forward very fast. I was a, I was a, that's my specialty is veterinary sports medicine rehabilitation. And uh, I first got introduced to rehabilitation from uh, Bob Taylor um, out at uh, uh, Denver. He, he worked at dogs at the Mile High Kennel Club and, and, uh, I actually, at my little place, <laughs> in my pseudo dog farm there in Kansas City, uh, my wife and I would rehabilitate some dogs there, uh, and that's how I got introduced to rehabilitation. And that field has just exploded in the past um, 20, 30 years. We created a recognized specialty that was um, uh, recognized by the AVMA in 2011, and it's just, it's really, it's grown up since then. It's really, yeah. really neat to be part of that. Yeah. Now, one one other thing on, on performance medicine I wanted to ask you about was uh, uh, the situation where a dog will run uh, more than one time in a day, uh, and that's true in both lure coursing and amateur racing. They'll run at least twice in lure coursing, and in amateur racing they, they'll run three times, maybe four times. Uh, is is the idea of uh, uh, snacking. In other words, you start with a light meal in the morning, and then what do you do in between runs to kind of give them a little boost and to make sure they're not running on an empty tank? I consulted with you about that, and you had some great <laughs> ideas, which I tried out and which seemed to work. So tell yeah. us about that. 60% of the time or 90% of no, the time? No, uh, all the time. <laughs> all the time. Well, that's a good one then. So um, first of all, we're dealing with greyhounds, and before I talk about anything related to that, I got to say, yeah, we always worried about bloat, you know, and yeah, so yeah. Uh, you, you always uh, have to have that kind of the back of your mind. If I uh, put something that goes into the stomach that could create a pendulous type of situation where it flips, you know, greyhounds can just get nervous in there and something will flip. Um, and uh, so... I preface anything I say, like the first thing I want to make sure is that, you know, I'm not putting the dog or the greyhound in a scenario where, you know, um, I could create uh, a bloat situation, right? Um, so now that I got past my, uh, you know, CYA situation there. Uh, when you're dealing with snacking, there's a volume thing there. 
uh, especially if you got multiple events in a day. Uh, you really want to make sure on the Friday before, the Thursday before, whatever, that 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 their their glycolytic stores are maxed to the to as much as they can be. And there's two things there. One of them, there's you can train the system to hold more glycolytic energy. Uh, you can also snack to enhance or top off, make sure that it's all there when needed. Um, and then when you go into the event. You know, you can do something in the morning to kind of give a little bit. But post-event, there's a half-hour period where the dog still mentally and physiologically has not stopped running. <clears throat> that you can give uh, a glucose or uh, some sort of uh, energy snack in that time period. And that, because the dog is still in the state of uh, metabolic extremes, if you want to call it, all the, the, the cells are ready to receive glucose. And so when you um, put glucose in there, you know, the, the, the muscle still thinks it's running. It still thinks it needs this glucose to keep going. <clears throat> so when you give it in that time period, um, it'll actually go straight into the muscle cells instead of, you know, to fat or different stores in the body. If you wait till, um, you know, more than an hour after that, and I'm just estimating a lot of these things, half hour to hour after that, uh, the body shifting to back to where it's going to try and store that energy instead of let it go to the muscles. <clears throat> so if you want, you can, you can snack after each event, and that helps top off the glucose stores throughout the day. There is some times that you got to understand that there has to be, the, bot, the dog's body, the greyhound as well, is designed to burn fat as an energy source. Uh, that's why they're an endurance animal. They out, they typically outrun their prey, uh, even greyhounds. Um, and so you have to have the core uh, sources of energy, the triglycerides and the fats in there as well, because if you go totally on the snack, uh, the next day, a lot of times the dog will run deficient. So you need a good base diet to support the snacking that you're doing. Uh, but what I found is that this uh, somewhat snacking, if you if we call it that, with the glucose <clears throat> after each event, say on a Saturday, uh, it'll help you be prepared for the next day <clears throat> and get through the weekend. But it's it's really kind of a, a combination of a good proper diet with the snacking on top of it. Did that kind of address what you were thinking there, John? Yeah, yeah. And, and so the just to just to make sure we, uh, the listeners and I have it right, you want to give them that snack within 30 minutes of the completion of their, of the run. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and then what, and what do you think is the best, what's the best snack to give them? Well, I wouldn't give them soot. <laughs> 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 you know, you're not going to give them a fat. You got to have something that <clears throat> it has to have something that's um, almost like a pure glucose. 50% dextrose is one thing, you know, we've he's out in, New Mexico, when we were running uh, lurchers out there, I would go into the quick shop and buy carol syrup. It's kind of basically syrup. You know, we, there was a time we were putting, a, I don't remember, I think it was like two cups of sugar into a gallon of water and creating sugar water. I mean, it's the if you give a, uh, say you give raw meat, the meat goes into the body and has to be digested before it can actually turn into energy. If you give anything with fat, the fat has to go in and be digested and turned into something with energy. When we're talking about snacking, it has to be an immediate energy source. So it has to be really almost like a raw glucose or um, uh, dextrose, something of that, that form uh, that allows that energy to go straight from the mouth up through the intestine and straight to the, to the muscle tissues. Yeah, I can remember putting a little caro syrup in a, in a bowl and just letting them lick that. And yeah. then they were happy to do it. They liked it, and uh, yeah. it got it into the system without a lot Sometimes of Sometimes you can mix it in with some uh, beef broth or chicken broth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except you got to watch out for the salt. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great tip for all of us that uh, run in sports that require the dog to run more than once uh, yeah. in, a, in a day. Let's, let's talk, Rob, about what you're doing now in terms of uh, your, your rehab, uh, uh, your sportsvet.com. Yeah. site and so forth tell us about that well it's I, you know if i want to look up lucky guy in the book i really would see my picture there because you know i've, I've been a very very lucky man person to uh 
I'd be able to fall into a <clears throat> career and, and a path that I love and and uh, and my wife stayed with me through it all and my <laughs> she was very supportive of it my sons were part of all of it and they've been you know they both my sons I had them raise one litter of greyhounds so that they would understand uh, what what the, the responsibility of all that is uh, they've been great so <clears throat> when I went to the University of Kansas and uh, got that postdoc in uh, performance it it really opened a whole new world of uh, to me that I could I've never I wouldn't have ever experienced and then the opportunity to work with the racing greyhound and and um, and um, I, it's hard for me without you know John getting kind of emotional about how cool my life has been you know certainly I've had my ups and downs and we've all had times where you know uh, the Greyhounds, I spent more money than we had and <laughs> hoping for that next little check to come in. And yeah. Diane and I'd say, we need to get another litter. And she goes, no, we need to get no more, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and food food bills and things like that. That You know, no one gets into the to the Greyhounds really or to the Sighthounds or to dog sports really to make money. They get in there really, they have to have some sort of outside money to do it. But, you know... Uh, Long ago, I, I was working under Dr. Carol Zevis, my mentor at the University of Kansas, and I learned the proper way to uh, study, <clears throat> performance to study. You know, back then, uh, phones didn't have cameras. I don't know if today's group understands that. Uh, we actually had to film greyhounds with 16 millimeter film out of the, uh, the woodlands in Kansas City. Had to send that off and it had to get developed uh, I think it took three days to do that. <laughs> then I shown that uh, <clears throat> uh, movie down onto a table, and I had a onion skin and a pencil, and I would dot out the the movements. And it took weeks to analyze a dog. And and nowadays, you know, you can do it in five ten minutes. And it, when I was at Auburn, <clears throat> working with the human biomechanics group there, I always threatened that the graduate students should have to go through the the pain that I went through. <laughs> But they all said that that's really too much pain, Rob. <laughs> they shouldn't have to do that. <clears throat> but so I've continued uh, all along the, the route um, looking at ways to best assess and analyze um, uh, performance dogs. Uh, you know, we did a lot of work with the military. A lot of it applied to uh, different types of breeds out there. Uh, <clears throat> we found ways that we could condition and train dogs so that they're their paws were structured and, and strong, um, found ways to uh, condition and train dogs so that they uh, wouldn't overheat. And all of that's now started flooding into my world. Um, you know, uh, once uh, I got into this world, I just, it, it's, it's been, I learn every day um, and, and I've enjoyed it so much. One of the things that, you know, a while back, I, I used to give a lot of lameness, lectures back in the <clears throat> 1990s and I used to do a lot of stuff and I finally a while back I put together a little book based on those lectures uh, a uh, <clears throat> general bio, uh, basic biomechanics and uh, functional anatomy for uh, the <clears throat> dog owner it's you know I, ha I was I saw a little uh, review uh, on uh, Amazon the other day it was uh, someone from somewhere that was very highly educated and said this that the, the the book really was too basic but when you first open a door into the world of movement you need to have the basic information and i that's what i prepared this book for was for people who uh, may not necessarily have a phd in in, <clears throat> in anatomy or biomechanics and so that was kind of fun doing that uh i'm currently working on a um, a uh, an app that can be used uh on the phone so that you can capture a clip uh, of a dog running, a horse running, whatever, and um, <clears throat> then you can play it back, analyze it. If you need to check foot angles or whatever, you can do that. I had tried something about uh, three years ago, but it was so heavy on the software side that it didn't really, it didn't really work in the tablets or the phones. And I don't know about you, John. Your life's probably been perfect all the way, but you know, I realized oh, I made a mistake there. We need to step back and readdress this. And so I've been working with a group, uh, putting together uh, uh, an app uh, to help analyze dogs. You know, I, I it's so exciting to me. We uh, I still get to I get a lot of people contacting me. Uh, 
I've I've ran into so many great people in, in my career, and we get to keep in touch. And um, they'll call me up, and whether it's a a bird dog that's only working six hours and it's supposed to be working eight hours, or if it's a <clears throat> a whippet that doesn't seem to be making the turn like it used to, uh, I love those complex questions. Uh, it really taps into my experience, my knowledge base. It tests me. I'm not always right, um, for sure, but but every time I go through that, I learn something new if I'm not right. Um, but we usually figure everything out. And, and what's cool about it is the, the, the people that have these performance or working dogs, uh, greyhound people, sighthound people, whippets, Rhodesian roachbacks, the borzois, uh, they're so enthusiastic that it's fun to work with them. You know, that's, uh, they'll come into, to me and, and they'll tell me all about it. And, and, I don't mind. I mean, I get their enthusiasm. I, I, I have the same enthusiasm as well. And so when we work through these things, um, you know, for me, it's just a, it's not work. Um, so I, I've kept my feet in the game, I guess, if you will. And, and uh, I keep plug, plugging along and, um, and uh, enjoying uh, the opportunity to work with athletic working dogs. And, and really, I don't want to, you know, I should say, you know, those greyhounds really got to me early in my career. And so I do have a somewhat of a soft spot for the sighthound and the greyhound world. I, you know, John, I know one time I'd lost a brood female uh, not too <laughs> soon before I had come over to talk to you guys. And I had, hadn't really realized how much it meant to me till I talked to you guys. You know, that, that emotion's there and uh, a passion's there, whether it's uh, – uh, a greyhound or uh, you know a military working dog, uh, I, I I get the, the the feel. I just love working with these types of dogs. Yeah, yeah. Now you're you're currently located in Lancaster, South Carolina, and if somebody wanted to consult with you, would they do it through the SportsVet.com website? <clears throat> yeah, if they'd reach out through SportsVet.com um, and uh, Canine Care SportsVet.com. Uh, we are part of a project that I think I can talk a little bit about uh, where we uh, um, well actually I'm part of a couple of projects I'm working right now where it's kind of fun we're, I'm working with a group out of uh, the University of Cape Town in South Africa they did some work uh, he's a robotics engineer and he was looking at how cheetahs run and, and how they could uh, design robots related to uh, how cheetahs move or well how they could design the robots. <clears throat> and a few years ago, I guess 10 years ago, time flies, uh, we hooked up and uh, he'd seen the, the, all the videos that I had taken of the, of the greyhounds. And, the, and so we started talking how we could maybe partner up. And that right now we're looking at how uh, ways, because there's a way that the, the dogs run and it really is exposed to the greyhounds where there's almost a decoupling of the front end and the back end of the dog in a turn. You know, they they run uh, very fluid, but when they go into a turn, it's a, it's a it's really interesting. We I've realized that all dogs do it, but I didn't pick it up till I started watching the greyhounds. <clears throat> so I've partnered up with this um, um, group out of the University of Cape Town, South Africa, because they've developed a way to analyze cheetahs uh, without markers, and it's it's a six camera system. So I've I've worked with the local sighthound group here, and we're going to capture some stuff related to that. Um, you know, I, I keep in touch. I've got a colleague at Michigan State, Dr. Sarah Scholl, that I work with quite a bit. Um, and I, I, I work with her. She's a, a great uh, sports uh, medicine vet. And there's so many other young uh, veterinarians out there that are interested. It's been fun to I've tried to find a way to pass on my, uh, my knowledge, my errors, my mistakes, along with my successes to uh, help others learn in, 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 this, in this field. Yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. So you, you can you still see, uh, clinically see dogs there in in Lancaster. Yep, I can. I, I have the ability to to um, work with some dogs here. That's great. Have to be. What's, there has to be a veterinary referral. Yeah, yeah. What's uh what what's your what's the future hold in terms of your projects? Have you got anything kind of on the beginning drawing boards in addition to the robot from the cheetah and the greyhound? <laughs> Yeah, actually, I do, and it's it's a it's a kind of a work of love. You know, I uh, 
I'm trying to put together a, an online, you know, they have all these online courses nowadays, and, and I see uh, books out there and stuff. I, I'm trying to put together an uh, online course uh, on uh, canine science and performance, or canine performance sciences, uh, for those that might be interested. And, and I'm, I've got the first three classes together on that. It, it's probably labor of love. It'll come out in the next few months. I, I'm really kind of excited about that because, um, you know, they got this thing now, John. I don't know if you know, it's called the World Wide Web. And <laughs> people can talk everywhere all the time. And it's it's uh, it's so fun because I I now get information or questions from anywhere in the world. And I, you know, there's people like us everywhere. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's so fun. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. Well, keep up the good work, uh, Rob. It's been a great uh uh, time here conversing with you and also it's we've had a great relationship over the years you've, oh, you've done great work on my own personal dogs uh, so it's been great <laughs> to have you thanks for joining us thank you you guys have a great evening thank you so much greyhound lovers we'll be back at the next episode thank you for joining us and i hope you enjoyed the conversation with dr gillette Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you're not a regular listener, be sure to follow Greyhound Nation wherever you get your podcasts. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Grey Nation Show, follow us, and you'll get notifications every time we release a new episode. You can also get new show notifications when you subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you like the episode, leave us a review on our Facebook page or your favorite podcast app. You can also send us feedback or questions via the contact form on our website at greyhoundnation.dog. That's greyhoundnation.dog. This episode was produced in collaboration with host John Parker. Our theme music was composed and performed by Dimitri Taras. We wanted to say thanks to Dr. Rob Gillette for joining us on the show today. You can learn more about his research in greyhound sports medicine at his website, sportsvet.com. If you'd like a consult for your greyhound, reach out via the website or send an email to caninecare at sportsvet.com. Finally, you can find his book, Athletic and Working Dog, Functional Anatomy and Biomechanics, on Amazon.com. I'm Michael Burns, and you've been listening to Greyhound Nation.